some 300 people present. A day absolutely straight from heaven, defying the forecast of the past few weeks that the day would be wet, that it would be windy. The gods relented to the prayers of the novenas of Mozart. An art in I was born in a place called Dun Sheen, close to the sea, about three miles to the east of Dingle. That's where I grew up, farming area, good land, lovely scenery, the Atlantic Ocean spreading out from us. And if you turn towards the north, the great range of mountains, Dun Sheen and Nakalish and Dangan I was the fourth in a family of eight children. My father Timothy, or Teddy as he was known, was of the third generation of Moriarty's in Dunshean. My mother, Katie Quinn, came from a mile outside of Dingle Town, a place called Cown Bowler, on the way to the Connor Pass. I was born in our own house at home, and so were all my brothers and sisters. But as even happens nowadays, not everyone, unfortunately, survives birth. And that happened to one in our family as well. I couldn't tell you the exact year or what age I was. We were pretty young. Died at childbirth. A, a male child, it had been a brother. But anyone that died at childbirth in our village, they weren't buried in what were known as consecrated graveyards. They were buried in a different place, prehistoric burying ground. There is a, a Shanochel in Irish, Esco Achela Varn Adina, that everybody needs everybody else. And that's the way when it came to the big days of work, uh, I always look forward to the days of what we called unmehel. It might be a big day bringing all the hay, there was no silage in my younger days. All the hay would be in the field in small, what we call wines of hay. But come a certain day then, they'd all be brought to the haggard and built into a huge stack or cock of hay that would be as high as any hotel you'd see in Dublin or anywhere. At least one person from every house would come helping. That's the, the spirit of the Mehal, and it created, if you like, a greater community sense, a sense of community. There was no radio on Dunshin when I was growing up. But there was one about a mile away in Sheehy's of Ballantagart. And the first time I ever heard the radio, it must have been an All Ireland final. I wouldn't be too sure, it was in 1938 or 39. And the kitchen was full and there were people outside the kitchen. But what stayed in my memory that one man, Mikey Sheehy, he lived in the house, he was in charge of it, and nobody else would be dare put their hand on it even. It was he would twiddle the knobs if the sound was going off and he'd be very delicately handling it and so on in case he'd do anything that had caused the sound to disappear. And to me it was a marvellous contraption. Something in the corner there. And you were being told about something that people all over the country wanted to hear about at the time. You were hearing a commentary on a match as it was going on. Martin McHugh will be joining me all in America. Me the Mahako Jimmy goes far to Rove, could he part to Gasman, the male Farish and so. The ball is in the championship of 2006 is on. Dermot McCabe with the first man to get a hand to the ball. He's been fouled and it's a free to Cavan. Cavan played down to. I would always consider that, that I'd be the link, that it's a service for, if you like, the public at large. Nobody is more important than the listener, I think. They're the people really that create the interest. They want to know what's happening. And the one thing you're supposed to do on radio always is keep talking. 40 metres out, the kick is ending. Larry Riley, the first goal at the Bank of Ireland Championship 2006. It goes to the common men. Larry Riley wins. You need somebody then to keep notes, to keep an eye on the dugout who's about to come on. You'll be following play. Something might happen down at the other end of the field that the other person might see. Out in the goal, he's trying to shot in toward the goal with the right foot. The umpire raised All the members of my family at different stages, they came, but they didn't happen to be still a student, you know, and I hope she'll be a student for a long time yet, you know. I had never set out what I wanted to be. 
The idea was you keep going to school, you do what exams were to be done, and then you took the consequences. And I got the call and there was no question in those days of turning anything down. You took it and it was a, a secondary school, medium of Irish completely for everything. It was in the Cork Isle that, and that more or less ordained you are we going to come a teacher. Now it was a major change in my life getting the call. Suddenly it dawned on me, I'm going to be leaving here leaving the land and leaving the sea and leaving the friends I had gone to school in Dingle and I always liked working on the farm, missing all that. But on the other side of the story, it was very attractive to me. I'll be going away. I'll see new places. I'll meet new people. And what was extremely attractive, I'd have to go on the bus. And I had never been on a bus in my life. I was christened really Michael Moriarty. But once I went to Balavordna, now my name was Michal Omerherty. The same as the name of everyone else was Shauna Hennefein or Padre Omericu or Brian O'Loughlin or Liam O'Mailoin or Padre O'Mailoid or Dunnaca Macculla from Inishbo Finn. Everything was Os Gaelge. We spoke nothing but Irish among ourselves down in the shops in the village or anything. And whether you came from Dublin and we had a few students from Dublin, we all had our Gaelge and we didn't think there was anything odd about it, that our whole life revolved around it. And of course, the only game there was football. No mention of hurling. It was all football. It was a football area in Cork anyway. And um, that was our life. It was in Colosh de Isagoyne that I had my first connection with commentary. I don't know how it happened. There was general chaos in the hall, you know. Some people kicking a paper football up and down the hall, others maybe doing a bit of singing and moving around. And somebody got up on the stage, he got a little prop for some play with BBC written on it. And he was going around talking about, sort of imagining he was on the BBC, giving an account of the event that was happening. And I remember distinct, distinctly taking it off him and saying that I could do it better. Tardine and Arthur Geller fooling down the game is on the ball, thrown in by Patrick Kelly. Cork playing down toward the railway goal in the first half in the ball. Nobody got it into the hand yet. Picked up by Jerry O'Connor and the first test of Henry of the centre back, John Tennyson. And he's now engaged in a shouldering match. And that's a foolish thing for a man <laughs> that was getting treatment for his shoulder all the week. Pressure as he poked the ball out the field and there to pick it up is Henry Shefflin. Henry Shefflin inside the 45 from out the wing. What a majestic point! The point of the game so far. And John Ogre has been down toward the goal, locked inside by Dearman, held inside again, struck it by Aidan Fogarty, and it's a goal from Kilkenny by Aidan Fogarty there. He snapped it up, and now it's 1-7 to Kilkenny and seven points to go. As I said, we have listeners all over the world, and we have listeners at home as well, and one is... Nelly O'Connor from Blarney, 95 years of age. She attended the Thunder Lightning final of 1939. He's running, but he's not alone. His way is blocked. Sean Oak sent it down the field. Jordine comes out, tapped out the field again. Brian Cochran is in there. There and John Tennyson again. Tennyson and Manny Wave, the man of the match. The game is over. Kilkenny have won number 29. And the dream of a cost three in a row has ended. When television came, 1962, only the All-Ireland semi-finals and finals were on television. But the radio was on every Sunday of the year and giving a terrific service, I always thought, as it still does. So I always felt I had a loyalty to the radio. There were times when I could have switched over, but I always said to myself, I began with the radio, it's there the whole year round. I'll stick with the radio, and I, I, I made that decision, and I have never regretted it, really. Give us a test on that speech, Mike. Then. One, two, one, two, one, two. Testing. Hand out three, can't push your shot. 
All storms begin with a gentle breeze. Gradually they gain strength and momentum. And before long a powerful force takes control of us all. It is the way of the annual GAA Championships. The build-up from that early summer breeze, the increasing crowds north, south, east and west, as the championships advance and lead to the big days at provincial venues, and finally to those days of great atmosphere, camaraderie and expectation at Crow Park, where champions are crowned and go on from there to join the immortals that have gone before them. Does anything compare to the championship? I remember now in all Ireland finals, a way back I would say it was the 60s, maybe even the 50s, that Michal O'Hare used to devote all half time to sending greetings to particular people. It was very interesting where the All Ireland final was going, and it always fascinated me. It's happening in Croke Park, but there are people right now, the four corners of the world, they'd be listening to. Some had come from a land beyond the sea to answer the call. Of the Irish personnel working with the UN not listening to the match in Cyprus. Cardine and Artigella fooling down the game as on the ball thrown in by Patrick Kelly. Down I think it's great because it's a link with home and it is wonderful to know that as it is happening in Croke Park, those people everywhere all over the world can hear the games now. The game is now in full flow. The players are dashing up and down the field. The ripple that began in May is now a raging tornado with cheers and groans rising to heaven every single second. The crucial moment of the game is now at hand. Stand by for the clinching score of the championship. Shahuive, cool the town! And as uh, my good friend John Moriarty, he might be a distant relation of mine. The philosopher who lives halfway up the Mangotson Mountain down in Killarney. If you meet John, you know, he might say it in Irish or English. Isn't it a great day to be alive? Is it a great day to be alive? about 40,000 present here today and among them the Lisbon under 14 team who beat England the West Kerry final not too long ago for the first time since 1982.